And let the church say amen. amen. And let the people of God shout praise the Lord. I am so excited to be here today, um, to be with each of you, um, to be amongst such scholars and intellectuals um, makes me excited and happy and glad, uh, for you are the ones who uh, will transform this world and turn the world upside down. And so I'm glad to be here with you on today. Um, can we give this gospel choir another hand? They have done an excellent job leading us and the brother Dix uh, for leading them. I mean, this is, I mean, they're phenomenal. That's all right. And we'll have to get y'all over to Baber at some point to sing to the glory and the honor of Almighty God. Um, I'm thankful to Pastor John for his friendship, and I'm thankful um, for his continual invitation to come share with you um, as we serve God uh, together. And for that and to that, we thank God. I thank God for the members of Baber Amy Church um, that are present. Baber, wave your hand. Wave your hand. Baber, wave your hand. That's the members of the church where I pass. Now, I looked at Tremere. Y'all know Tremere? Uh, Tremere, wave your hand. I said, wave your hand. <laughs> Tremere didn't wave his hand when he waved his hand. And um, I told him, if, make sure he's in chapel so I don't have to embarrass him. Um, but he didn't wave his hand. So y'all meet Tremere at some point, all right? All right, now look, this is what I need y'all to do with me. I don't know if you remember, um, but uh, in my tradition, we have something called call and response, all right? So when the preacher says something that connects with you, that sounds right to you, that sounds all right to you, you have to say, amen. See, look, somebody got him. If the preacher says something um, that sounds a little difficult to you, Sound a little hard to you? You gotta say what? Mm. If it steps on your toes, there you go. See? Brother Dick's got you. All right. But you gotta talk back to me, all right? Because if you don't say nothing, I'm gonna think that you don't understand what I'm saying. And I'm gonna keep on talking and talking and talking until I think you get it. All right, can we do that? Yeah. All right, very good. All right, um, now normally Pastor John provides me with some specific text that I'm supposed to preach from or some specific context from which to preach from, um, but he gave me wide latitude um, this year. He told me just preach. Um, for example, the other year, um, he told me to preach on, um, it was after the resurrection, and so we preached about how we continue the resurrection. Some years ago, we preached, um, we were dealing here on the campus with um, dysfunction in families. And so we preached on um, dysfunction in families. Um, but this year, he didn't tell me anything specific to preach from, uh, which actually, in a way, was harder for me to figure out where to come from. Um, but I don't preach from um, the church calendar, uh, the lectionary, or anything of that nature, but what I believe in something is, I call it preaching to the times. That means I gotta look around and see what's going on in the world. And when I see what's happening in the world, that helps to shape and form where we come from and from whence we preach. And so on today, uh, we want to do that. We want to preach um, in the midst of the times in which we live, is that all right? All right, so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. That gives you time to find it. I'm searching. Time to look it up on your phone. I didn't get service in here. I ain't got the password. So I couldn't get no service. So you know what I did? I'm telling you, this, I mean, I use my brain. I took a picture of the scripture because I couldn't connect to the Bible on my phone. See, plan A don't work. There's always a plan B, C, D, E, F, and G. You just got to make a way to make it happen. Amen. Amen. That's a sermon right there. Make it happen. Do what you got to do, but make that thing happen. All right. All right. Y'all got it? All right. 2 Timothy 
chapter one. That brother over there, he said, I ain't got a Bible, but the girl beside him did. So he said, let me throw my arm around this girl. <laughs> that was smooth, brother, that was smooth. <laughs> he said, let me get a little closer to you. <laughs> Don't try to throw the arm down now, we already seen it. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter one, um, the New International Version delineates these words. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith. Your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am now persuaded lives in you also. Verse 7, for God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All right, look, I want you to find somebody on either your left or your right. Find somebody and look at them, 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 look at them. If you're looking at me, you're being disobedient. Look at them. And I want you to say, hey, neighbor. Y'all gonna just keep on looking at me? Hey, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. We are not powerless. Find somebody on the other side. Find them and look at them but not me. Find somebody, look at them, and say, hey, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. We are not powerless. Now, I want you to take your arms and throw your arms around yourself. Take your arms and throw them around yourself. And I want you to say, hey, self. Oh, self. I am not powerless. That's what we want to preach on for just a few moments. We want to preach on the subject, we are not powerless. Come on, let's pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. And dear Lord, let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and let my will be lost in thine. Lord, we've come to the commencement of a new week. We've come to the commencement of new struggles. We've come to the commencement of new opportunities to serve you, but also to face fears and challenges. And God, we pray that you will speak a word to us that will strengthen us, that will empower us, that will help us be better when we leave out of this place. Lord, we love you, and we ask you to speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit. For Lord, if you don't speak a word, we don't know what to do. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beloved hearts, in this particular letter, certain events have caused the church to take on a spirit of fear, which made the church unable to continue the work that Jesus had started. Uh, for example, when the church's mentor, Paul, who wrote this particular letter to them, was in prison because the establishment labeled him a troublemaker who incited others to protest and rebel. The church took on a spirit of fear, which made the church unable to continue the work that Jesus had started. Or when Nero started to persecute men and women who spoke truth to power and declared, thus saith the Lord, the church took on a spirit of fear which made the church unable to continue the work that Jesus had started. 
or when the church started to see their families disrupted, started to see their structures destroyed, and started to see their lives torn apart, the church started to take on a spirit of fear which made the church unable to continue the work that Jesus had started. But before the church buried his head in the sand or raised their hands in an act of surrender, Paul reminds the church that faith and fear cannot coexist and prods them to remember the spirit that God had poured inside of them. Before the church bolted their doors and sterilized Jesus into a meek and mild savior that did not care about the present condition of the world, Paul reminds the church that faith and fear cannot coexist and prods them to remember the spirit that God had poured inside of them. Because the spirit that God poured into them is the same spirit that empowered Jesus to confront social structures that kept one poor no matter how hard that person worked. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Because the spirit that God poured into them is the same spirit that anointed Jesus to liberate men and women trapped in a web that we now know as mass incarceration. Because the spirit is the same spirit that God gave the disciples that transformed them from a room of scared men and women that were scared that Jesus, the same people that killed Jesus, were about to kill them and turn them into bold disciples that would turn the world upside down because the spirit that was poured into them is the same spirit that conceived Jesus in the womb, is the same spirit that gave Jesus power when he was hanging on an old rugged cross because the spirit that was poured into them is the same spirit that picked Jesus up from the grave. Paul said faith and fear cannot coexist because God poured his spirit inside of you. I focus on this particular text today because if the truth is told, these past few weeks have caused numerous people, even people in this room, to take on a spirit of fear. Because our nation's deep-seated racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia has been exposed, so many people have taken on a spirit of fear. Because there's been increased incidents of blatant hate and harassment in our schools, in our stores, in our churches, and even in our homes, we have taken on a spirit of fear. Because racist flyers were distributed in Pittsburgh and Bright and a swastika, and the word Trump was spray painted in a dormitory at SUNY Geneseo, and flag prides were burned in the city of Rochester, we have taken on a spirit of fear. Fear. Because executive orders have been issued that ban men and women because of their faith tradition and even ban men and women who flee from their homeland because of persecution and terror and war. Just like Jesus had to flee from his homeland when Herod wanted to kill him as a baby, we too have taken on a spirit of fear. Because we don't know who or what will be attacked next, we have taken on a spirit of fear because it seems like hate has the microphone. We have taken on a spirit of fear. But before we put our heads into the sand, before we throw up our hands in an act of surrender, I want to remind somebody in this room on today that faith and fear cannot coexist because the Spirit of God lives inside of us. Before we start to think that we have no influence and no power to stop evil in its track, before we start to think we have to accept what is thrown at us, before we start to think that some man has the last word over our life. I need to remind somebody that the same spirit that lived in the disciples, the same spirit that lived in Jesus, the same spirit that lived in our foreparents, all 
also lives inside of us. Before we start to think that we are powerless, that we can't do nothing, I need to remind somebody that we are not powerless. That right there is where you say amen. I know that we are not powerless because I can recall the faith of our four parents. In verse 5, Paul recalls his mentee's four parents, Lois and Eunice, because his four parents had a faith that did not tremble in times of prior persecution. Paul recalls his mentee's four parents because Lois and Eunice had a faith that did not shake no matter how hard men like Saul attempted to persecute and terrorize the church. Paul recalled the faith of Lois and Eunice because Lois and Eunice had an unshakable, unbreakable, unquenchable faith at a time when other people had fled and given up on God. So now their sincere faith becomes a bold witness to the present church that had a spirit of fear that made them unable to continue the work that Jesus had started. Their faith became a witness to the present generation of the power that God had poured into people. Uh, and in the same manner, the faith of our foreparents is a bold witness to us that we have power. Somebody shout power. Their faith is a bold witness that we have power. Because if colonists had the power to overthrow tea into the Boston Harbor and resist British rule until British rule in the Americas ended, then we do too. Because if Frederick Douglass had the power to make speeches and write books until slavery was abolished, then we do too. If Susan B. Anthony had the power to hold petition drives and make speeches and write articles until women could vote and the 19th Amendment was passed, then we do too. If Gandhi had the power to use nonviolent civil disobedience to lead India to independence, then we do too. If Rosa Parks had the power to start a movement that ended discrimination on buses, then we do too. If Thurgood Marshall had the power to go into the Supreme Court and dismantle separate but unequal and destroy Plessy versus Ferguson, which said one race was more inferior than another race, uh, then we do too. If unnamed men and women who had much less than us have the power to march and protest and sit in and resist uh, until justice rolled down like the waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, then we do too. If our four parents had the power to turn the world upside down, then we do too. We have power. This text says, I know that we're not powerless. I, I know that we're not powerless because I can recall the faith of our foreparents, but I also know that we're not powerless because I can recall the faith of our Savior. Yeah, I can recall the faith of the one who was sentenced to public execution on a cross. Uh, I can recall the faith of one that they hung high and they stretched wide. Uh, I recall the faith of one who was stabbed in his side. Uh, I recall the faith of the one who was spit on and the one who had a crown of thorns put on his head. Uh, I recall the faith of the one who was put down into a palm tomb. Uh, the one who stayed in that grave on Friday, the one who stayed in that grave on Saturday, the one who stayed in that grave on Saturday night, but early on Sunday morning, he got up from the grave with all power in his hands, and because he got up with all power, that means you and I have power too, that means we have power to turn the world upside down, we have power to make this world a better place. We have power to stand up against hate. We have power to help somebody. We have power to transform this world. So 
I just want to challenge you that when you go out of this room, uh, when you leave this chapel experience, uh, when you head back to wherever you're going, uh, don't forget that you have power. Uh, don't forget that God poured his spirit inside of you. Uh, don't forget that you're stronger than what you think. Uh, matter of fact, God gave you power. God gave you love. Uh, God gave you a sound mind. So don't you waste it on trivialities and foolishness, but use it to make this world a better place because we have power. Say amen. 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 And amen. I'm done. Amen. Come on, stand up on your feet. This world won't ever get better if you sit back and do nothing. This world needs you. It needs your mind. It needs your energy. It needs your heart and your zeal and your soul to make this world better. If we sit back and do nothing, that, that's when gangs happen. We sit back and we do nothing. That's when crime happens. When we sit back and do nothing, uh, that's when persons are allowed to be bullied and dehumanized. When we sit back and do nothing, that's when this world sinks into a soul, slow basket towards hell. I want you to pray with me. Pray with me. Merciful, gracious, and everlasting God. Lord, we thank you that we're not powerless. We thank you, O oh God, that you pour your spirit into us so that we can be co-laborers on this earth with you. God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you gave us your Holy Ghost to make a difference in this world. Now God, when we start to feel overwhelmed, when we start to feel like we're David and we're facing Goliaths, when we start to think that we can't make an impact or a difference, God, remind us of the power that is inside of us. Remind us that the same power that picked Jesus up from the grave lives inside of us. Remind us, oh God, that we've not been given the spirit of fear, but we've been given the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. God, help us to be effective ambassadors and witnesses for you. And even as we go through this school experience, remind us, God, that our tools are being sharpened, not just so we can go out and make a whole lot of money, but so that we can improve the world, so that we can send the elevator back down to help somebody else. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we honor you. God, we adore you, and we thank you for all that you're doing. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, the Christ, we pray. And the children of God shout amen, 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 amen. and aid to the man. Well, beloved hearts, be blessed. Go in peace. Fight God's peace.